My topic today is sleep management, inshallah. We're going to talk about this. It's very important. Um, just a little bit of history of what instigated me to actually come up to, with something like this. Um, what I found was when I moved from Saudi Arabia to Riyadh, oh, sorry, from Canada to Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia, I realized that I met a lot of students of knowledge. I was meeting a lot of the people who were doing talab al ilm. They, they were uh, on the path of seeking knowledge. And, and what was really interesting for me to see them was like their sleep patterns were all over the place. And that's usually what you find over here, even in, in Canada. I don't know if that's the case in UK. But the minute the brothers get practicing, then they find it's all cool and fine that, you know, I'm hanging out with the right type of brothers where I'm going to stay up all night long, chill in a coffee shop or something. We have Tim Hortons in Canada. I'm sure you guys have something equivalent, Costa or something. And, you know, you stay up all night long, talking, joking and stuff. But it's halal fun. And uh, even sometimes you find students of knowledge, people who are seeking knowledge, you'll find that it's normal for them to stay up all night, completely all night long. Sometimes even people who are calling to Islam, like du'at, who are active in da'wah, you'll find that their sleep patterns are all over the place. And that is impacting their families, that are impacting their health and all of that. And I'll tell you my story about it, and then so you can actually realize how much sleep can make a difference, just little uh, differences that you can have in your sleep. Firstly, so a little bit of history for me. Um, my sleep was exactly what most of the people's sleeps look like today. It was all over the place. Uh, I would sleep whenever my body would want to go to sleep. Sometimes I'll be up all night long with my friends, chilling. Even when I moved to Riyadh, uh, these questions were there, but I was hanging with the, the same type of people. And I was like, OK, that's the way to do things. These are طلاب العلم. These are people who are studying with my scholars, my mashayikh. So this is the way to go. <coughs> and what, what started happening was I would come home, I'll go to work, and I'll find myself completely exhausted. And I would I'd sometimes knock out at work. I'd be like you know, sitting on the, the desk and you'll just have this ghafwa. You'll just like, you know, doze off for a while. You probably go in the car, you doze off. Then the solution you find for that is, okay, you know what? Let me get a cup of coffee to wake myself up. So you drink coffee upon coffee. And then obviously, since your sleep is all over the place, your hormonal balance is all over the, you know, your hormones are all in imbalance. You didn't get enough rest for your, your internal organs to function properly. Uh, hunger kicks in, you start eating, you start binge eating. And eventually what happens is you start putting weight on, you start like a whole bunch of things. Just one little sleep mismanagement and then this series of reactions that take place in a person's life. What happened in my life was something similar. In 2009, I, I was a very you know, muscular person, 105, I used to weigh, I used to do, do weightlifting and stuff. I moved to Saudi and threw my sleep management all over the place. And you notice that over the period of five years, so I have a machine that tracks and sends my weight to the Wi-Fi automatically, so I don't need to, to record it. Uh, so I went from 106 to one, uh, hitting 136 last year uh, in September. And what actually did, did that to me what triggered my research into this? Can you tell me what this is? Blood pressure. So I recorded this at the doctor consistently. So I was like, I'm in my, I, I just turned 30 and I'm, I have like worse blood pressure than my grandfather. Right? Oftentimes a lot of young people, you might think that you're completely fine. But if you just go and do a, a thorough physical checkup, you're going to find that you know, you're all over the place. Your health is just deteriorating. And when that happened, I was like, no way. That can't really happen to me. So I need to take some serious changes. So I started researching, about, you know, attending courses, listening to online lectures about what is, some, what is wrong with me. Because uh, I seem to be a healthy person. I've never had any chronic diseases, but all of a sudden, I, I'm having white hair all over the place. Uh, even like, you know, uh, when I was like at, at a doctor, he's like, I've never seen somebody in 30s having white hair on, his, on the shoulder at the back of their neck. So they're like, that's very early for you. So already my, I know that my body is deteriorating very fast. So I had to make some considerable changes, right? My usual intake of coffee was around seven to 10 cups a day. An average American, I don't know, British people, American d does about five to seven cups a day to keep him up. America's biggest problem, there's a, there's a talk on TED called America's Biggest Problem. Uh, it's about sleep, you should watch it. So it t tells you how bad uh, Americans are and Canadians are you know, when it comes to their sleep. 
right? Occasionally, small cup would not do. So I would go for, you know, I'd go into the shop and I was like, you know what? Just give me the largest cup you have. That was the standard thing because my belief was the more caffeine I put in my system, the better I'm going to be. So this was me uh, a good f around four months ago, all on coffee. So I used to feel tired all the time. Uh, I had excruciating pain in my joints. If you remember, like last time when I was there, Mulana was here, uh, I, I could not lead Salah. I could not do such, like, and I'm not like, I, I, I don't have any chronic diseases. And all of these things were happening to my body and my doctor was not able to understand what's going on. He's saying something's wrong with you, really wrong, but he didn't know what was wrong with me, exactly. Uh, I had no energy, like I, I felt energy less most of the time. Uh, I really had to sleep in like 10, 12 hours to be able to do something for a good seven hours. Uh, again, another thing that would happen was, since you don't have energy, um, you're, you don't have clarity, uh, urges of procrastination kicks in. And now students over here, you know exactly what procrastination can do to you. You have exams, no problem, inshallah, I got two weeks left. I, I got still two days left. Oh my God, exams tomorrow at eight o'clock. And you're staying up all night long. And all of these are, con you know, uh, the, all of these are domino effects of us, procra the procrastination. But the real purpose of why you procrastinated in the first place, if you look at it, is either uh, clarity of mind, your, your mind is all fogged up, it's constipated, so you don't have clarity. And you know that when you're going to sit down to study, it's going to cause you a lot of pain. And unless the stakes are high enough, you're not going to move into an action phase. Usually that's how human beings are. Unless the stakes are high enough, we don't move into action phase. And what really interestingly was happening to me was I would get angry on every little thing. Like just rage from inside of me. And I couldn't understand what was the cause of it. I, I, I decided to do a lot of research. I attended a couple of workshops on sleep management. A bunch of them were just jabroni stuff talking nonsense to you as so you got you got to sleep eight hours a day your body is designed for this and all of this stuff but soon you'll find out it's all rubbish nonsense <laughs> that people say now what i'm going to base my talk about today is going to be on three pillars three basic things number one i want us to look at sleep from quran and sunnah aspect so we spend one third of our life sleeping right and if we do that, I was like, it's not possible that Allah and His Rasul has not given us guidance on this. Then we'll talk, we'll look about some scientific research about it. <coughs> and then obviously I've shared some personal experiences and I'll share much more experiences uh, further down the workshop. Okay, number one, the, uh, the, the purpose of this workshop, how to de determine optimum sleep, how to discover minimum requirement for our body's uh, sleep. So what is your, every person has a unique requirement for their sleep. So how are you going to discover this requirement? So I'm, I'm going to take you through that, through that process. And obviously, how will you increase the quality of your sleep? So what is optimum sleep? Question for all. Anyone can answer from the back, from the front. What is optimum sleep? <coughs> Good. So it's sleep. That you, when you go to sleep, you wake up and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm good to go. I can do stuff today, right? Have, have you guys ever been through this phase where you sleep for an hour and you feel like you slept for eight hours, right? And you wake up and you're like, oh my God, it's Fajr time? And they're like, no, no, it's Maghrib. Oh, really? Right? <coughs> In reality, you only slept from Asr or you know, after Asr for a while. And why did that happen? So we're going to learn about that today. But more importantly, what is optimum sleep? Before that, we need to answer another question. Why is this so important? Why is it important for you to learn about your sleep? Anyone? Why is it important for us to learn about sleep? I can definitely see there's a problem here because all of you guys showed up for sleep management. <laughs> <laughs> why, why do you think it's important? To be, productive. to be productive, okay. What's the most important thing that is linked to our sleep, which will be asked on the Day of Judgment? Time. Time, Time. and? So salah. Your Salahs, right? If you mess up your sleep, you mess up your Fajr. 
you must you probably hardly get a chance to do tahajjud uh, one of the most important prayers for a muslim's life and also all other sleeps will also get met, met up so if you stay up all night long and you you know you miss fajr you miss zuhur you wake up in asr and then you 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 know say okay inshallah i'll read you know qada of the the two salahs no problem inshallah and then you go back to sleep at the wrong time some people stay up all night long until zuhur and then they go to sleep and then zuhur asr maghrib isha is gone so again <clears throat> Why is this important? But it is linked to some important things about life. So 36% of our life, an average person's life who ends up living for um, around 90 years of age, let's say if he lives 90 years, Russell Foster, he has a, Russell Foster has a very good video on YouTube. Uh, if you just type up his name, Russell Foster, uh, Why We Sleep, I think, on TED. A very, very nice video. <clears throat> Talks, gives you about the science of why we sleep and how we sleep and stuff like that. We're not going to go into that intricacies. If you want to learn more, you can uh, just refer to that video. Okay, so let's say if you can save 1.5 hours of sleep, useless sleep, I call it, sleep that you really didn't need it. Uh, you can take out your phones. Tell me how many hours would we save in a year? Let's see if you got some engineers, some mechanical engineers that were in the car with me today. Where are they? <laughs> 1.5 times 365. 5.47. Okay, so if you divide that by 8. So if you save on a daily basis 1.5 hours of useless sleep, sleep that your body does not require, you end up saving close to 64 or 68 days in a year. 68 days means you can launch a new company, you can launch a new project, you can do so many things with your life. So just saving 1.5 hours of useless sleep in a day, that's how much additional value you can have in your life. The art of measurement, miqdar, qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extensively talks about it in the Qur'an. And there are certain maxims, maxims that Allah has mentioned in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَ عَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ He says, وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ عِنْدَهُ بِمِقْدَارِ Everything in the accord of Allah, in the account of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in due measure. Everything is measured. The number of days you're going to live on this earth, the exact time you're going to enter, the exact time you're going to leave, the exact time of your, when you're going to get sick, and how many times are you going to get sick during this period. Every single thing is measured. Again, you, you'll be shocked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it again and again. He says, خَلَكَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَقَدَّرَهُ تَقْدِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. But when He created everything, He According to, like he gave due measures to everything. So he created everything and then he says, فَقَدَّرَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ تَقْدِيرًا This thing requires this much length, this much width, and this much length, and this much lifetime. And all of this was appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for any, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in this world. إِنَّ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَاهُ بِقَدَرٍ Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms this. He says, indeed, I have created everything. We have created everything in measure. Everything is measured in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here's a quick thing that I did. <coughs> so if you look at the sunrise and sunset, <coughs> over here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not. <coughs> on 14th of December 2013, the sun will rise on 704, sunset 1700, 9 hours and 56 minutes and 10 seconds is going to be the length of the day. The noon is going to be at 12.02. The altitude at which the sun is going to rise is going to be 33.1 degrees. And the distance between the earth and the sun is going to be 147.25 uh, 147 kilometers. That same, let's say after a century later, we come on the same 14th of December 2013. The sun rises at the same time, sun sets at the same time. The day has increased by 10 seconds. Then the, sun, the noon is the same time, the altitude is the same, the distance between the earth and moon has increased by 0.29, instead of 0 0.250, 0 0.290.
And then what I did is I correlated all of these dates. So I started the whole month of December of 2013 and correlated. And you'll be surprised. There were times when the sunrise was different. And the sunset was the same. And the, the, num the, uh, the length of the day was exactly the same. The noon was different. The altitude was different. And then the distance between the moon and uh, the, the, between the earth and the sun was the same. And that's just one of the ways that you actually understand different verses of the Quran. So you, when he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, we created everything with measure. Try to see <coughs> what things around you are operating on a prince, like they're operating on a set principle. You know, you can do an exercise about the, the sunrise and uh, sorry, the moonrise and moon set and when the moon comes out and the phases of the moon. Just just do a comparison. What, what how is the moon going to look like today and how is it going to look like after hundred years? And you're going to see that there, there are minute differences. Now, that's not the only place you can look for. Distance between the earth and the moon, it's a scientific, between the earth and, and, and the sun, it's a scientific fact that it continuously changes. It fluctuates. Why it fluctuates, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Science is trying to get an answer for it, but Allah knows why it fluctuates. Our body temperature. Our body temperature flunch fluctuates, but you'd be even surprised. How many of you are in medicine? Somebody's doing medicine here. Good. So there are certain body parts in our body that has a different constant steady temperature than other body parts. Because that particular body part requires that particular temperature for it to operate and provide the optimal service to your body. So if you measure it in like 0.1 degrees, you'll find that you know a certain body part is always going to have a different temperature. <coughs> then again, you have the range of sugar levels in a human being, in a, in a, from a person to a person. The, the, the doctors always say, you know, just don't take it on your one measurement. Make sure you do a week, one week, week long measurement, so you'll find your, your steady, the, what, what's your norm. Similar thing goes for blood pressure. Maybe, you know, 120 over whatever, 60 or 70 is normal. And then, you know, for some people, it's 130 over 80. That's their normal. For every person has a different normal steady blood pressure rate. <clears throat> the different minerals that we have in our body, every person has, is different. Certain people, they can operate in a very low iron and they're completely fine. Other people, when they go down in iron, things started going wrong. Their thyroid started getting messed up. If they go high in iron, so certain people, their thyroids get messed up with high iron. Again, every body is made differently. So then I have a question for all of you, a million dollar question. <clears throat> Why do you think sleep should be different? Why do you think sleep should be different? Or why should sleep be different? When for blood pressure, we cannot take and cut and paste a standard formula or a standard number. When for sugar, for everything, then why sleep should be different for us? So each one of us has a, a, a complete sleep cycle. Now, given this fact, I'm missing a lot of information because this workshop is usually four and a half to five hours. I had to cut down from the slides. I think the, the PowerPoint slides were around 187 slides. I think we're down to some, I think 40 or 50. So I cut down a lot of, you know, things that you, your body has a natural clock and what's the science behind that. So I'm not going to go into that. But again, you'll get a flavor of that. <clears throat> so why should sleep be different? What's the Islamic guidance on sleep? What, 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 what do we have any guidance from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about sleep or about the Quran? Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says in the Quran, Surah Nabi says, "Wajalna nooma kum subata, wajalna al-layl ribasa, wajalna al-nahara maasha." Let's just analyze this first. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Wajalna nooma kum." We have made your sleep. Naumakum, your sleep, subata. What does subata mean? Comfort. What does the word subata come from? What's the asl of the word? Sabata. Seen, bata. There's another word which is Saturday in Arabic is called what? Sabt. Why is it called sabt? The Jews are not allowed to do activities maybe? Yes, so what would they do? It was a day of their? Comfort and rest. <coughs> okay. Sabt was basically means it was the day of their rest and comfort. Now look, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala over here. He's talking about it that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has made wajalna subata. Allah has made your sleep for you 
a comfort. Sabt basically means something that uncovers you in complete rest and calmness. Right? So for the Jewish people, the day of Sabt, it was the day where they would comfort, they would not do they would not do worship, they'd just you know rest. It was a resting day for them. Then Allah says, Wajahalna Layla Libasa. And then we've created the night libasa. Now the word libas, libasa is it means covering. But what the, what's the root of this word, libasa? Labasa. Okay, labisa yalbisu. Right. Now the root of the word is la ba sin. Lips basically means two things. One, something that. So to, the, the, the dictionary definition of the word lips is something that gets mixed with something else. Right? Kamsi. Amrun mulabbas. The matter is confused. Something multabis. The matter is like it's con con you know, concocted. I can't understand what it is. It's mixed up. Now, lips, when it's used, when it's used for somebody that is speaking, and when his words. When, his, when this person's words are ambiguous and they're not understandable, then the word labisa is used. Okay, that particular sense with labisa is used. Now, later on, <coughs> the word labisa started getting used with cloth, with wearing. Because what ends up happening is when we wear a particular piece of cloth, it becomes part of us. It becomes part of us. It, it becomes, it, it's on top of us and it's become mixed with us so you cannot it's like you know you cannot take it off Sharan. but it's part of you and it's it's yani talabbasa beek. it has become part of you it has mixed with you and from there the word labisa comes for libas something that you wear now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying waja'alna layla allah has made the night similar to your cloth similar to the dress we wear to cover you i.e. it is meant that the night is there to cover you so that you can have the first part which is subata. See, you cannot have a good night's rest until you have a good blanket. Right? So Allah has created the night for us to disconnect from all our worldly things that we have, all our distractions that we have, so we can have this comfort from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this blanket, and then he made the sleep for us, subata, something that we seek comfort in. So two things that Allah has put in place for us. Then he says, for people who do not understand, Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشَ Indeed, Allah has created nahar, He has created the day, ma'ashan, a place for you to go and seek your sustenance. Ma'asha comes from Aisha. Aish basically means for you to live. The, day, the place, Nahar, is for you to live your day. Nights are for you to sleep, not chill. Days are for you to go and chill. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says another verse. He says, هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ لِتَسْكُنُوا فِيهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that made the night so that you may find sukoon in it. Now, Taskunu comes from the root word of? Sakana. Sakana means what? Huh? To live. to live. What does it mean? Okay. Sakana means something to become silent. It means I'll come back to your live to live. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, in modern day, sakana in, in dictionary basically means litaskunu ilayha, something that you find peace and tranquility in, sukun, sakina, comfort. You find comfort and peace in that. From there you have a house is called Maskan, a place where you live. Because when you come out of your home, when you're outside of your home, and you come back home, what do you feel? You feel the sense of comfort. You feel the sense of belonging. And that's where the word Sukun comes, you know, for you know, Maskan, the house uh, comes from. Similarly, Allah says, وَجَعَلْ <coughs> لِتَسْكُنُوا فِيهَا فِيهِ فِيهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the night for you so that you may seek, you may go and seek 
sukoon, peace and tranquility in it. In it. I.e. if we're trying to find peace and tranquility and, in, and, and trying to sleep and trying to find peace and tranquility at daytime, it's not going to happen. Recently I was reading one of the studies that chat that it was saying that the grave, graveyard shifts or people who do night shifts, they've actually found that it's counterproductive to the, peop the companies. So the company might be running 24-7 operations, but they have found that you know, their night shift people were having more incidents, more accidents. And one of these companies were actually called Schlumberger. It's an it's a oil producing company, work in you know, petrochemicals. And they've actually passed, they're actually doing this study right now, and they're very close to banning uh, night shifts. So the, the work is only going to take place at daytime. No more night shifts because the cost of them and of due to accidents and incidents that were taking place in the petrochemical plants were a lot more than for them having those people working overnights. Shlumberger will come back again. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, One nahara mubsira. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made nahar, the day, mubsira, so that you may see things. Everything is going to be visible for you at that time. In this are signs. لِقَوْمٍ يَسْمَعُونَ For people who listen. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made the dua. He said, بُورِكَ لِأُمَّتِي فِي بُكُورِهَا Allah has put baraka for my ummah in the early hours of their time. <coughs> and he made a dua in another, another narration. اللَّهُمَ بَارِكْ لِأُمَّتِي فِي بُكُورِهَا Oh Allah put blessings for my ummah in the early hours, which is right after Fajr for my ummah. Why is it, we need to have a little bit of a conversation here. So why is it that after Fajr, your bed seems the most comfortable? And you, you cannot resist that. It's like, it's so tempting. Why do you think it's, it, that happens? Shaitan. Shaitan, because he wants to deprive you. He knows all of these ahadiths. <laughs> he knows, right? It's like, if he gets up, he is going to have so much barakah in his life. Any of one of you has tried actually preparing for your exams right after Fajr? Have you ever tried preparing for exams, going to sleep on time, getting up maybe 10 minutes before Fajr Adhan and then getting up right after Fajr and going to the school or somewhere and preparing for, for your exams or working on your assignment or your projects? Anybody tried it? Anyone? Okay, what was your experience? You failed? Yeah, it's like, you know. <laughs> this table looks so nice to sleep on. <laughs> right? It failed for a reason, right? Uh, what's that chemical called? Ad ad adenosine? That runs in your blood? Those, those hormones? Is that how you pronounce it here? Adenosine? <laughs> no, no, adrenaline. No, 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 no. We don't want that one. <laughs> Stay away from that one. Okay. So what else is, why, why do you think it becomes, why do you think it is difficult for us to stay awake after Fajr? Aside from shaitan playing with us, what else? Not enough sleep, not enough quality of sleep. Right, we're not getting good quality of sleep so that when we get up in Fajr, automatically we want to be in this form of, خلاص, I just want to, you know, just like hit the bed. Other thing what happens is, at Fajr time, <coughs> Usually one of the, I was reading, um, um, I, I was listening to one of the, the podcasts, what's this guy's name? Uh, Michael Clayton. Yeah, I think his name is Michael Clayton. And you know, I was listening to one of the podcasts and he was saying that, you know, the first thing he does, like when he gets up from his bed, is he, he takes, he wraps his blanket, like a white guy, right? He's like, he puts his blanket and everything and he tosses it in a cupboard and closes it. So that he knows that, you know, there's no way he can get back to his bed. Second thing he says is he has his, his everything, like if he's going to work, then he has all his clothes, everything ready the night before. So that he can go get up and go straight into the shower, get ready and come out. So you have to change phases, you have to change that mode of sleep. If you're still in your sleeping pajamas coming to Fajr Salah, then chances are that you'll end up sleeping on the prayer mat. Right? Because you, you are in that mode. So you need to disconnect from that mode. Rasulullah his sunnah was, كَانَ يَقْفِزُ He used to jump out of his bed. Right? He would jump out of his bed to stay away from it. Now, let's say those of you that have succeeded to stay awake after Fajr. 
This is where the other dilemma kicks in. You have succeeded. Alhamdulillah, you beat shaitan and you fought your nafs and you stayed awake all after Fajr. Nothing happened and you now went to work and you're all good to go. Something happens, right? So you find over here, this is your energy level, 4 a.m. You're really up right there. Around 1 p.m., you start feeling a drop, right? Noon time, right, right after lunch, this, from 1 to 3 is where it just goes like plummets, right? And at 3 o'clock, if you've been up since Fajr, your body is almost like ready to give in. By the time you come home, you are like gone. Now, let me tell you something interesting about this, this pattern. So I learned, right? Barik aburika li ummati fi bukuriha. Allahumma barik li ummati fi bukuriha. So I said to myself, I am not going to sleep after Fajr. Khalas. Done. So I'm going to fight myself. So first morning I come to the masjid, you know, obviously. And I stayed in the masjid and I told the brothers, I'm like, brothers, you know, you can't sleep after Fajr, man. This is a hadith from Allah. Allahumma barik li ummati fi bukuriha. It's hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can't sleep after Fajr. We got to stay awake. Right, so I'm the Rambo of not sleeping after Fajr. And I'm telling everybody in the masjid, in Zuhr time I meet them, guys, you can't sleep after Fajr. Alhamdulillah. And the same thing is happening to me, right? So I hit almost rock bottom around 9 o'clock. And then guess what happened next morning? I did not even wake up for Fajr. <laughs> right? And I was like, no, there's something wrong. It can't happen. And then guess what happened when I went for Zuhr Salah? Ah, brother, not sleep after Fajr. Where were you for Fajr? Right? What happened to you at Fajr? We were all waiting for you. I was like, brother, you know, just like, you know, the, I didn't hear the alarm. You know, just like, it kept ringing and ringing. Kind of like what happened today. Right? You know, it kept ringing and ringing and ringing and I just didn't hear it. Right? So then I realized, okay, there's, I'm missing an equation. There's something missing in there. <clears throat> so how many of you know about beauty sleep? And they call it this REM sleep. Heard of that? People in China, we got these Chinese contractors that come, from, come to work for us in Riyadh. During like a work hour, like they're working with you at like at 12 o'clock, they're like, I got to go. I'm like, where are you going? I was like, my nap. I have to do my nap. And literally they go to like a, a, a meeting room and they put their head on the, the table and they take a 20 minute nap. And obviously all my Saudi friends around, they're like, Hajib wallah. <laughs> and they're sleeping in the middle of Hajib wallah. Saraha, kif, how is this possible? These guys are sleeping in the office. But again, they're much more productive than us. <clears throat> they control most of the economy in the world. Now, so there is a hadith about Qaylula. Who can tell me? 13 minutes after. Huh? What's the hadith? Uh, to do qaylula because it's shaitan. Yes. Qaylu fa inna la taqil. That do qaylula, do that small nap in the afternoon. For verily shayateen, do not do this. Shayateen, do not do these, these naps. Now interestingly, I said the next day, okay fine, I'm going to get up after Fajr, I'm going to try qaylula. Right, so I stayed up after Fajr. So my life cycle is all messed up, right? So I'm, I'm experimenting these things, right? So I did Qaylula and I, 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 I went home, told my wife, listen, I'm only here for half an hour. I'm just going to, you know, take a nap and I'm just going to head back to work. She's like, fine, no problem. She's like, don't let me sleep past 1.30. Like, I'm here at 1, don't, like, just wake me up. She's like, fine. So I stayed up Fajr again. And I arrive in my, around like, you know, one o'clock, my body is like completely dead. And then I go to sleep. And guess what happened? I slept till four o'clock. It was so nice. <laughs> Best sleep ever, right? My body was like, you need this. So I'm like, there is something wrong with the equation. Because I'm trying everything that the Quran and Sunnah is telling me. Something is interfering with my sleep. Because it shouldn't, because hadith and Quran cannot be wrong. Usually, a usual human being. So that's the pattern of a person who does not do qaylula. Now, somebody who does qaylula from 4, around 1, 12, whatever, anywhere, anywhere between 11 to 1, you can do that. 
um, it has to be before Asr Salah. Your Qaylula, that beauty sleep has to be before Asr Salah. So what happens, when you, when you take a nap, right away your energy level kicks up. It goes right, like you're back. A half an hour sleep and you're back at prime energy level. And then what interesting thing, what interesting thing happens if you ask people who are following this way of life, that they do not get this drop. So that, you know, it's not like logarithmically it goes down the way it is going down over here. As a matter of fact, it kind of like tapers and it stays in that, in that range. Like it just stays in that high range all the time. And it's just subhanAllah, it is so amazing that you know, if you do this properly, without having stimulants in your body, we'll come to that. Um, you'll find that you know, you'll get up at Fajr at 4 a.m. in the morning. You'll take a quick nap around 12, 1, 2, whenever, but very important you take it, half an hour. And sometimes, you know, I don't have time, so I just even, like, I go to the parking lot, like in the basement, I'll just sit in my car, start it if it's hot, or leave it, you know, and just put my alarm on half an hour on the seat. And then I just come back to work. But what's really interesting is when I do come back to work, uh, when I come back to work and when I finish work, I get back home, I still have a lot of energy left to do a lot of other things that I want to do in my life. And there are times when I could be up since till 2 a.m. in the morning, I can be up 2 a.m. in the morning, go to sleep at 2 and get up for Fajr and not feel tired. So you can start maximizing your days. How many of you know Dr. Zakir Naik? I had a chance to personally spend a Ramadan with him. And every day like we were you know, talking to him, sitting with him, having iftar with him. And I remember I asked him, I was like, how much do you sleep? How much do you think he sleeps? Average day. Eight? Yeah. If you know Dr. Zakanar, you'll never say eight. <laughs> it's, not, it's not possible. He sleeps three hours, three hours on a day, on an average day, three hours. If he is traveling, like if he's doing da'wah work and he's traveling for da'wah, and then two hours. And I'm like, how do you even begin to... You know, I could not understand that. But when you actually realize and you get rid of these stimulants from your life, from your body and system, you'll actually find that it's actually possible. Remember the had, you know, we find about Umar radiallahu anh, that during the, the reign of Khilafah that he did, he did not sleep. Right? So they have this thing called, I think, pliophasic sleep. Because I don't know, don't quote me on this word. But if you just type in like Tim Ferriss and the CEO of WordPress, they have a two-hour talk about how he accomplished WordPress to be the most phenomenal tool on internet and how sleep paid an integral part in his success and how he did not sleep for almost two years. So these are people who are doing this in our lifetime, right? And then he used that same... So when I saw that his pattern, he has a graph, a picture of it, that he would sleep for like one hour and then he'd just like get up and he's ready to go for another five hours, and he'll go to sleep for one hour, then he's ready to go for another five hours. That's exactly what Umar did. It's mentioned that he would be sitting in his, <laughs> in his gatherings, and you know, all the, the governors, they're sitting there, and he would be like, in Alhamdulillah. <laughs> and he would just sleep. He'd just knock out. And everybody knew, so they would all just wait for him to get back up. And then he would just carry on the meeting. Number one, why do we sleep? Sleep allows the brain to review and consolidate all streams of information it gathers while we're awake. So, do you know this, this have you ever seen this picture of, uh, remember old days, Windows 98, and your, your disks, your computer gets really slow. So then somebody, some smart IT friend of yours tells you, do disk fragmentation, right? So you leave, you, 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 you click, you know, fragment disk or whatever, and then, you leave that computer for a while and you hear your, your hard drive going and it's doing all these weird things in the back and then you see these charts and then eventually you see this is what it was before and now all of the data has been consolidated. So that's what the brain does when we go to sleep. So we have accumulated, accumulated a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of things, a uh, lot of memories, good, bad, positive memories. So when we go to sleep, it needs to consolidate a lot of that. So that's what exactly it's doing at, at, at that time when we're, when we're sleeping. Now, other thing, it stocks up on fuel. Our brain, re, you know, 
require it's like it's I think one t they were saying like muscle like if you look at the percentage of fat it's like one tenth of our body but it, it consumes more than 25 percent of the energy right so it needs to stock up on that energy it needs to revive itself because it's the functional the, the key element of a human body the key organ of the human body that keeps a human body going second third thing sleep operates in some mysterious ways to help various skills such as how to play piano or ride a bike uh, these are all theories, scientific theories, and you'll actually get them also in Russell Foster's uh, video. He talks about them. These are theories that exist in academic journals. Um, don't know the, the, why they are there or you know, what's the, the fact behind that, uh, whether it's true or not. But again, for me, the most sensible one was the first one, which is like it, and it allows your brains to defragment. A normal sleep cycle, right? You guys have seen those sleeping, you know, you can download these apps on your phones. Tells you your patterns of sleep. You can have these wristbands. Tells you the, the type of sleep you have, the quality of sleep you have, and how you sleep and stuff like that. Very important. If you, if you cannot measure, like, see, one of the most important things you need to, to enhance and get your sleep better is more data that you collect about yourself and your sleep, the more easier it's going to be for you. I'll tell you, like, a little experiment that uh, I don't know if I told Mulana or not before. Um, so with this, we're, uh, with Fitbit, um, it tells you how many times you were restless during the night. It tells you how many times you were awake during the night. And it has ways that measures that. It has a nine axis thing and uh, whatever. Now the interesting part, every time at night when I go to sleep and I read all my duas before going to sleep, all of them with meticulous you know, concentration, and my heart, I get up next morning and my Fitbit tells me I was awake zero times and I was restless zero times. Again, this is not like scientific research that's going to get published. This is something that happened with me and I'm just sharing with you. And then the nights that I miss where I was busy with something and I slept on the sofa or something like that and I didn't get a chance to read those du'as, you'll find like next morning when I get up, it says awake so many times, restless 21 times. <clears throat> and it's subhanAllah, it's interesting. So I thought maybe it's just, you know, hoax that's playing with me. So I put it on my wife's hand and I, I used her as a, as, as a test. I was like, you know, don't read your du'as tonight. Just, just, just for the sake of science. You can do that. We allow, it's allowed in Islam. <laughs> so again, it's really interesting that we, were, we kept discovering this particular pattern that every time you read your du'as and adhkars properly, something mysteriously happens to your soul and you, you sleep well. And when, you, when we sleep in a state when we're not connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we're not in wudu, then something else happens to us. Now, every person goes through four or some people say five stages of sleep, right? So stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Those of you want to find out more about the stages, you can just type in stages of sleep cycles and read up on it. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, so stage one, stage two, stage three. What's really interesting is, you know, we go from stage one, stage zero, which is being awake, uh, to one, then one to two, two to three, three to four, and this is five. I think number five is missing here. And then this is called REM. So when we are between zero and one, this particular stage is called REM. Rapid eye movement. This is the most important sleep stage for a human being. Why is that? Because those of you that cannot get into REM, you will start becoming, you start having hallucinations. So you'll get up after two, three nights of not being in REM, you will start seeing things because your brain is not able to consolidate this. And it's a, it's a, it's a medical fact. And people have to take medication so that they can go into this REM sleep. This person that I told you about, Tim Ferriss, when he goes to sleep, like he has these monitors that monitor his sleep patterns. So he wants like, you know, he's really crazy about his sleep. So he, he monitors like how many times at a night physically like he went, like he has these things where he sleeps with, put patches on his head and to figure out that how many REMs he requires for him to be most optimal. Now, an average person requires two and a half to four REM cycles. So you will go from zero, one, two, three, four, five. Then you will come back at one, between this, between one, zero and one. Then you'll go back to four, then you'll go back to one, you'll go back to four, you'll go back to one, and you keep doing that. Why our body does that, nobody knows. 
But initially when we're going to sleep, we're going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then we'll come back to REM and then we'll go back to 5, then we'll come back to REM, we'll go back to 5, we'll come back to REM. And usually that takes around one hour the whole cycle. Now, REM is so important <coughs> that some of the doctors, they've actually found that if a person can even get one REM, one good REM, which only lasts around 15 to 20 minutes, but time in REM becomes, irre like, you know, the, the relativity theory of Einstein, it kicks in, in particular REM, so it, it seems like you slept for so long. So, remember when I told you first, if you slept for those, you know, one hour and you feel like you slept for really, really long, that is actually when you were in a constant state of REM. Because your body needed that time to consolidate. And that's why when you come out, you've lost relativity of time. So you come out of that sleep and you're like, oh my God, did I sleep for eight hours? But in actual, you were only in one REM section. So you might have a person who sleeps for eight hours and you might have a person who sleeps for five hours. And a person sleeping for eight hours, he might be only in REM 2.5 times. 2.5 hours of his sleep for, out of eight hours was REM. Whereas you can have a person who slept for five and in his five hour sleep, Three hours was REM. Who had a better sleep? Person B. Person B had a better sleep. So it's not the number of hours that count for you, for us. It's what is the quality in that number of hours that matters for us. Now, sleep gets, has interference. There are things that will interfere with your sleep. You have stimulants. We'll get to stimulants today. Uh, my workshop usually talks about stimulants, light and food. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over light and food over here because my slides are not going to cover light and food over here. We're just going to cover stimulants today. Light. There's actually applications you can download on your phones um, which will ch change the, it'll, it'll put like a, a, a color, like a, f a film sort of a color on your phone to change your blue colors and certain colors on your phone that impact and interfere with your sleep. Usually if you, if you look at your cell phones or iPads or, or, or your laptops, beyond, like after Isha time usually, at night time, for more than two to three hours directly, it will interfere directly with your sleep. We were not designed to do this workshop at this time at night. Right? These lights interfere with our sleep. We were designed that when it's sunset happens, it's time for us to start wrapping up. When there's still some light left, you have your dinner, you wash up, you come to Isha Salah at night, you go back home and it's time for you to sleep. We were designed so that we utilize that early morning light and we kick off everything from there. I've been to villages in Saudi Arabia where life still is like that. Even in certain villages in Pakistan, life still runs like that. Fajr, you know, it's subhanAllah, these people, they get up in Fajr and you'll find like Fajr and the guy is already gone. He's going to his fields or where, whichever work he has to do. And at Asr time, he's back. He's done work. I know a, 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 an organization, um, they, they call themselves Time Lenders. They're based out of uh, Karachi. In, and it's a professional organization. They do trainings all over the world. And their office hour starts right after Fajr. Their office hour starts right after Fajr. Part of the job requirement for the men in that department, in that company, is they have to pray Fajr in the masjid next to the office. So there is there, you know, the, the, the leader of the, the you know Suleiman, he's there making sure. And then if somebody's not there, hello, where are you? You missed Fajr. No bonus for you this month. <laughs> right. But subhanAllah, it's so amazing that somebody's taken a religious belief and tied it to a real company. And his company is so successful. He's like, he was telling me that at Zohar time, he's done. Zohar time, he wraps up, he's done. So, because Fajr time he starts, he's checking all his emails, responding all of this thumbs. 8 o'clock, most of the offices start working. 9, they start showing up. He does his meetings, this and that. 11, they come back from their meetings, they start wrapping up. 12 o'clock, Zohar, they go back home. Their work is done. And he's like, you know, then I go back, take my nap, get up, spend time with my family and Asr, I work on other things that I have to do in my life. So light directly interferes with your 
with your thing and there's a whole talk about that. Uh, food also interferes with your sleep. So if after today's talk, the masjid provided us, you know, brain food, what's that? Brain food. Pizza. Pizza. Sushi? Did you say sushi? You said nuts. Nuts, huh? Right. <laughs> well, you said the word yourself. Sushi, no, brain food is pizza. If we, get, if we eat a lot of carbohydrates before going to sleep, specifically one to two hours before going to sleep, try getting up next morning without having, oh man, I can't get up. It's so t Your body is going to be all tired and you're going to be starving. You're going to be starving, but your starvation is not going to be out of hunger. It's going to be out of sugar craving. Because carbs turn into sugar and then in the morning you want that sugar. So, especially having Hyderabadi biryani after 8 o'clock is not going to help. If, you, if you're biryani, if you're from India or Pakistan and you decide to go have biryani at 8 o'clock, usually if you have a Hyderabadi friend, they usually have biryani at 9. Right? And then they, they serve you at like 9.30 and 10 and then it's like it just becomes disastrous. So having a lot of carbs is not going to help you. In general, staying away from a very big dinner is going to be a very good plus for you. Uh, have a heavy breakfast, no problem, but stay away from a heavy, heavy dinners. Um, so we're not going to talk about food a lot, but we're going to get into stimulants now. So definition of stimulants, science. Stimulants are drugs that temporarily increase alertness and wakefulness for us. Right? They could be medically used. Uh, they're used in sports and all different functions. Occasionally, occasionally they're used to treat depression uh, in people. They're used to, to treat depression. Stimulants are sometimes abused to boost endurance and productivity uh, in, in sports athletes. And sometimes they're also used to suppress your appetite. So you can take like different uh, stimulants. You can take caffeine tablets. You can take green tea tablets uh, to uh, increase your heartbeat and suppress uh, uh, your appetite. Caffeine is the world's most commonly used stimulant. Caffeine. So we're going to get to this now. Costa is not going to like this presentation from this point on. Neither is Starbucks. So remember I said Schlumberger will be back again. So what they found that there were a lot of incidents that were taking place at night time. So they're like, there's something wrong. We need to do some research about it. So they got these special experts, mental health experts, physical health experts, this helpless disorder experts. And they said, okay, we want you to look into this. So they gave them one plant. And what they found was their incident levels historically were normal in the company. But the day they decided to put a coffee vending machine, the incident levels doubled in the factory overnight. There's a whole report that you can actually download. Just type in Slumberger caffeine report. You'll see that. So it doubled overnight. And the, 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 the board of this, the people that they, they, you know, these specialists that were gathered together, they concluded that the number one cause of incidence at night at the Schlumberger plant was caffeine and number two, sleep. So because of that, they eliminated the whole function completely and, and, and just brought them in, in at early morning hours. So caffeine has a lot of positives. You know, people are going to argue with me today after the, the, the thing. It's like, brother, I, have, I just read the news. You know, I just read an article yesterday. It said, you know, why you should have another cup of coffee. We're going to come to that. Improves alertness, increases capacity of your muscular work. People, you know, if you work out and stuff, if you, if you have, uh, you know, if you drink a cup of coffee or two before going to work out and lift weights, you're going to find yourself, you can do a lot of weights, uh, you know, and you'll have a lot more endurance. Improves motor skills and coordination. That's why if you're driving, you drink a cup of coffee, you find that happening. Better performance of, on mental tasks. So if you have a lot of mental tasks, things that you're doing that require a lot of mental ability, having a cup of coffee is going to help you. For sure, it's going to help you. And it improves reaction time too. So how you react to a particular thing is going to improve. And the most amazing part of it is after 15 to 45 minutes, depending on your person and the amount of food you have in your system, you can actually see the results of caffeine. Some negative things about caffeine. It has a half-life of seven hours. What do you think that, what, what does that mean? Half-life of seven, seven hours. So, when you drink caffeine today, a cup of coffee, 
a large cup of Starbucks coffee, around 50 milligrams, somewhere between 35 to 50 milligrams of caffeine exists in there. So at 50 milligrams of caffeine, your body is going to take seven hours to go from, you know, if you do not drink any more caffeine, just that one cup. So in the bloodstream, you have caffeine running. This caffeine is going to need seven hours before it goes from 50 to 25. They call this in science half-life. So it takes up to seven hours for it to become half-life in your bloodstream. From 25 to 12.5, it needs another seven hours. And from 12.5 to another half, it requires another seven hours. So if you have a cup of coffee today, roughly it needs two, hour, two days before that cup of coffee is out of your system. Completely. And what ends up happening is your body starts building tolerance with caffeine. So today it's doing half-life seven. Tomorrow your body will build tolerance to, to caffeine. So it will require you 10 hours or 15 hours before you go half-life. Because your body is building tolerance towards caffeine. You have, you're going to have a lot of stomach issues. And the interesting part, you will be restless. Yes, you might be alert, but when you're going to go to sleep, you're not going to have a good quality of sleep because you're going to be restless. It increases restlessness. And then it messes up with the architecture of sleep. And you'll see that now. <coughs> so your fresh mind brain activity. So this line over here is, think of it as your neurons. So they're sending these signals and then you have receptors on top. Every neuron has a receptor. The medical students can, you know, understand this better. That's the best way I could explain this. So I'm, you know, pardon me for my cheap uh, graphics here, but uh, that's the best way that I could do that. So your fresh mind activity works somewhat like something like this. So you have a receptor, you see these neurons that are constantly going, and that's, it. that's how everything works. Now, as you start getting tired, there's something called adenosine. It starts building up in your body, right? Let's move to the next slide. Okay. So you see this, you have adenosine that starts building up in your body. And as the number of these adenosine molecules are, exist in, your, you know, in the bloodstream, eventually one of these will come and connect with the receptor, telling your neurons, time for you to go to sleep. Time for you to slow down. And that is when you start having these <gasps> moments where your body starts telling you, it's like, okay, man, I'm tired, I really want to go to sleep, and you start stretching and doing all of these things, that's when adenosine is telling your neuron receptors, idiot, go to sleep. Time for you to go to bed. What do we do? Right when we feel that. Man, let's go grab an espresso from Costa. Then, when you take that espresso, espresso, your adenosine is playing, right? And it's, it's coming, and eventually you'll see what happens. The caffeine comes and sits on top of that receptor. So your neurons are in this mode that, oh, it's everything is all as well. I'm not tired, I'm not tired. Because it's waiting for the adenosine molecule to come and tell the receptor time for you to go to sleep mode. But this caffeine molecule has come and sat on that receptor. And it's very similar to adenosine. And it's, it builds up, so it, it acts. So the neuron, it, it comes and sits and connects to the receptor. So you, don't, so you are getting tired. There's lots of adenosine being built in your body. But it's not being able to get translated because it cannot get to the receptor to tell your brain you're tired. And eventually what happens, that the neurons get tired of those activities, constant brain activity. And the brain automatically goes to fail-safe mode and shuts it down. So you're not going to sleep because your body has told you to go to sleep. You're going to sleep because the brain says, I've been awake too long. And if I stay awake this long, I am going to go to sleep. I I'm going to mess up my brain. Something is going to happen. I'm going to get damaged. So it goes into this thing called fail-safe mode and it automatically puts you to sleep. And that sleep obviously is not going to be of good quality. Why? Because when adenosine comes and connects with that receptor, 
that receptor and you know slows down brain activity of your brain but it also starts producing other hormones for you to start going to sleep such as serotonin melatonin all these other hormones that you need that will help you to go to sleep uh, so people say you know what this is really really good but it's against a lot of other theories that exist out there and I tell them yes it is against a lot of theories there are two theories out there one says caffeine is good for us the other says caffeine is bad for us right if I ask you this question today what would you answer bad hmm interesting all right so let me prove to you that it's good can I so what happened in the, in the 50s in the uprising of cigarettes? Um, uh, before I, I just I just you know uh, a tangent. Um, there's this you know these late talk night shows, late night shows. I don't know the guy's name. I'm very bad with this, uh, but he somebody really did a really good show on cigarettes. Uh, it's called Jeff Jeff We Can. If you type in the word Jeff We Can. It's a hilarious show because he's a comedian, but actually he's 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 t talking. He's like literally attacked all the you know big big cigarette companies and this and that, and he's doing a campaign against how we should stop smoking. But it's a very good. It has a lot of interesting facts about how Muslim countries are specifically being targeted for cigarettes. How Indonesia is the largest you know consumer of cigarettes. You have children that are two years old that are smoking in, in, in Muslim children, who are two years old that are smoking in Indonesia. And how these companies that exist in UK and in, in Canada and US, uh, the governments are putting all these restrictions on them so they cannot sell their cigarettes. So they're finding other markets and the most easiest thing they can do is go and provide markets, enter markets such as poor, poor countries and provide cigarettes so cheap to them, so cheap that it does not make sense to them. But the only way it makes sense to them to sell a cigarette, cigarette that cheap is if they can have a lot of volumes. So if they have a you know low cost, but they have high volumes, it'll cover their cost. So they're even providing to this extent that you know small cabins and stuff like that, marketing and after marketing, they even provide you a free lighter. You cannot afford to have a matchstick. Some people are so poor they're gonna provide a free lighter. So watch this video; it's really good and obviously hashtag. It's called Jeff We Can. Uh, very, I think Muslims should get involved in these conversations. It's very, very good. So in the 50s, a lot of conversations were taking place. And these are some of the ads, from, true ads from the 50s. Okay, just to let you know how this industry of caffeine is good for you works. It's the same people who are running this. <coughs> it's a real snapshot of a real magazine. More doctors smoke Camel, which it's a brand of cigarettes, than any other cigarettes. And they had a whole article discussing why and this and that and over here you know this little thing over here it says you know doctors are the most difficult job in the world sometimes they end up working 21 hours a day or 24 hours a day and for them to take a, a cigarette is like a, a rest from all of their hard work and life and this and that the next ad now this particular article in the bottom it scientifically proves how good cigarette is for your health Dentists. Your dentist says you should smoke this particular cigarette because it has a better filter which will not damage your teeth. Right? I mean, these are real ads that existed in the 50s. Look at that. Some 20,000 physicians, and they have this asterisk in the bottom explaining who are these physicians. Right? Is less irritating. And then okay, again, it talks about it. Light and old gold instead of a throat treatment. If you're feeling, you know, <coughs> feel something, just light and old gold. It's going to fix your throat. Science, discover it. You can prove it. No unpleasant aftertaste after this cigarette. We've, we've taken care of the, uh, you know, unpleasant aftertaste. Read here, Ronald Reagan. He's signing a cigarette box. Right? And these are real people, you know. <laughs> I, I'm realistic, I only smoke facts. And then they had an ad. We don't want your taste buds to go to sleep. We don't, and whatever, bunch of nonsense. Again, so if, if 
you did not have the medical data today and somebody was to provide you these ads, it will make complete sense to you. Cigarettes are the safest thing to do. People were smoking cigarettes, as that's why it was allowed in the movie industry. That's why it was allowed in until a bunch of smart people from the medical industry realized it's all a bunch of nonsense. And they started lobbying against it and it took them a lot. Until this day they are fighting. If you watch this video, Jeff, we can. You're going to see that until how hard it is for the government. Like It's like these, these gigantic organizations of caffeine are driving government policies. And it's ridiculous. Like You have this government afraid of a company. Because their revenue is five times the revenue of the company, of the country. Now, some of you are in cricket. This is recent ad. Batting first, have, have this T, to fall insta T, you will score 300 runs. And you will be boom boom, not out. Right? If you know cricket, you know what that means. Now, T mania. Just in Pakistan, where country people cannot afford basic living standards, 2007 to 8, Pakistanis spent $161 million. That number. You add another 100 to this in 2009 and 10. And I was, I was recently talking to somebody, recent figures have surpassed a billion dollars in Pakistan. A country that cannot even have bread and butter, basic food is spending a billion dollars. So what is optimum sleep? We should be done with this. Eight hours? I don't think so. So here's how you find optimum sleep. Number one. <clears throat> following the following five steps. Number one, stop sleeping after Fajr. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Get a buddy, get a sister, get a brother, help each other. SMS, wake up, WhatsApp, whatever, phone each other, talk to each other, recite Quran to each other on the phone. If you can get together to somebody, you know, get somebody to be a partner with you in this particular thing. It's really going to help you. You cannot do it alone. Start doing Qailula. That afternoon nap, Make it your lunch. The way you don't miss lunch, the way you don't miss your breakfast or you know your whatever food that you stick to. Make sure Qailula is like your nap time. Tell your people, tell your office. I cannot do this. This is you know I need half an hour. I don't know how much time you get. Usually we get one hour for lunch. Half an hour for lunch, half an hour for your sleep. If you cannot get that, do a 15 minute break. Do not miss it. Do not miss it. Develop regularity in your life. That's the most important part. Try to have a consistent life pattern at least six times, six times, you know, six days during the week. One day you can go all crazy if you want, but at least during six to seven days, you know, preferably all seven days. I've, 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 I've alhamdulillah had a chance to meet a lot of successful people, both from the business side and as well as in da'wah. And I've noticed one thing in their lives, it's consistency. No matter where they are, whether they're traveling, whether they are um, you know, at, at home, whatever, wherever they are, they're consistent in their lives. They have an exact time to wake up, they're going to wake up at that time, the time. They have a cue card. I know one of the scholars, they have a cue card. They have a traveling cue card and they have a stay home cue card. That cue card tells them their start off daily routine. So all they do is they put that cue card so they know that if they're traveling, they take it out. So my cue card traveling routine. So when I'm traveling, this is the most optimal thing for me. And when I'm at home, this is the most optimal thing for me. So they've actually learned that, you know, what's the most optimal thing for them. And they've created a routine for them. So in the morning, like I know, for example, one of my teachers, Sheikh Yasir Burjas, if he's traveling or if he's teaching a seminar, he's not going to go to the masjid and pray salah. So we're like, Sheikh. How can you do that? Fajr Salah in the masjid and you know the hadith is for it. He's like, do you know the questions I get after Fajr? It throws me off for the whole day. I'm here to teach you guys. I need a mental state of mind. And after I come after Fajr and I come, I come back home, I can't. I can't focus on anything. So he says, I pray Fajr in Jama'ah. Would I get a couple of brothers to come in my room? We pray Jama'ah. But he doesn't, so again, he has a, a rhythm that he has developed that he understands this is the most optimal thing for him. <clears throat> Number four, become physically and mentally fit by focusing on exercise, diet, and reaction uh, and, and recreation. Now, exercise, I can tell you that even if you do three days a week, three days a week, 
Trust me, it has, it has made a huge impact in my life. Three days a week, activity level, your alertness, how much time and quality time that you can get, give to your kids, your studies, everything is going to change. Consider exercise as something you cannot miss. I'm not saying do it every single day. I've been, you know, alhamdulillah, for the last three and a half months, I've been consist consistent with my exercise almost roughly three, you know, three or four days a week. I try to aim for at least four. And I met a German guy that actually triggered this to me in my office. He's 64 years of age. And he said to me, you know, today I climbed uh, the Empire State Building. I'm like, what, you went to New York and climbed it? He's like, no, no, in the gym we have a stair climber and you can do landmarks. So I did the stair climber and I put, you know, Empire State Building and I climbed it. I'm like, 64 year old? I'm like, I can do that. I'm 31, 32, I can easily do it. So I went next day, registered the gym, got on the, the stair climber, and you know, I'm gonna beat this guy. 31, what does he think he is? I put stair climber up and you know, 10 floors later I was like down. I was like, oh, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, I tried 15 and khalas, my body gave up. But then I went to him and you know, I started talking. So he said something to me, he said, look, I've been doing this for 40 years of my life. You have to make gym part of your lifestyle. Do not go to the gym because you want to lose weight. It's part of your lifestyle. And if you adopt this lifestyle, automatically you will see the benefits. You're, you will eventually lose weight. You will eventually get muscular. But what happens is we join the gym because we find ourselves that we're really bulky and then we want to lose weight and we're not losing weight. Everything is you know, stuck at the same level and now we give in. So going to the gym because it's a lifestyle. St eating healthy, not because you want to you know, get good grades on exam, but because it's a lifestyle. <clears throat> Lastly, stop all stimulants in your life. If you can stay away from stimulants, trust me, that's the most important thing you can do, especially in, in students who are studying right now. Stay away from all tea, coffee, all of these things. Caffeine. If you really, really do feel the urge, like you're finding it very difficult, then you know what, I can give you permission to have a decaf coffee. But you know, pref I prefer you even stay away from that for the first good three to four months. Then once you've established yourself, then go ahead. You want to introduce. For those of you that are drinking tea, and you really want to have tea, what you can do is you can have your first brew. So you can brew the tea first time and throw it away. Now the second time when you brew the tea, you're going to have almost one, I think they were saying that you know, nine tenths of the, the caffeine is gone out of it. So you're just going to have one tenth of the caffeine left. So the amount of caffeine that's going to come in a red tea pot is going to be a far, far less. They call it the second brew. So you can, you can do that. But initially, stay away from all caffeine. Now, how do you find your optimal sleep? Eight hours and nine hours, that's the last slide, I think. Um, what you do is you first do the first five steps that I told you. And then when you are you know, off stimulants, everything, now you're ready to start experimenting to find what is the optimal sleep that you need. So what you do is you one day go to sleep early, wake up at Fajr, and record in a journal how you felt that day. Were you drowsy, sleepy, active? Because if you have overslept, you will be, you will be drowsy. If you have underslept, you're still going to be lethargic, slumber, all of that feelings are going to be there. So over and under, both are not good. So if, if you're still, you slept eight hours, start cutting in in. Seven. Next week, do 6.45, 6 hours and 45 minutes. The whole week, sleep for 6 hours and 45 minutes. Figure out how long it's going to take you. How are you feeling the whole week? And eventually, as you keep decreasing 15 minutes from your sleep, a day will come where you will be extremely fresh. You'll feel that you, you can actually recognize this difference. And then if you decrease less than 15 minutes, like if you say you, you sleep, for me example, my optimal is four, 4 hours and 45 minutes. If I can sleep 4 hours and 45 minutes to 5 hours between this range, I am f fully functional. Anything beyond this, I start getting headaches. Anything less than that, I'm not optimal, like my brain activity is not optimal. But again, so I came to 5.45, when I did 5.30, you know, so less than that, 5.30, I am not feeling well. So I require, sorry, not 5.30, 4.30. Four hours and 30 minutes, I don't feel optimal. Four hours and 45 minutes and five hours, this is the prime for me. 
And eventually, the more purpose you have in life, your body will automatically start shrinking this time. Because it knows that we have limited time in life. So it'll start shrinking this time for you. That was a quick summary of a five-hour workshop that we do. <laughs>